Good morning. I want to welcome you to Batley Baptist Church for our morning service. If you're visiting with us today, we always love to have visitors, and you're our special guest. Thank you for coming. I know we have a couple from North Carolina, and, and I'm sure there's others. And, uh, but uh, I want to say to you today that uh, it, it's our privilege uh, to worship with you. Uh, going to go to the Lord in prayer. Let me make uh, one quick announcement before I do that. Uh, there'll be a WANA meeting this morning uh, right over here after the, after the service is over. Uh, so be sure if you're involved in that, be sure to meet with Craig Webb. Also today after service, I'll have a funeral, so you pray for the family uh, that has lost their loved one. We've got a, a lot of needs this morning, but uh, we've got a God that's big enough to meet all of them. He said he'd supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. Uh, the David, David said, I've been young and now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken, and I've never seen you see begging bread. Uh, if you'd like to join with us on the altar, well, feel free to do that. We have altar prayer around here. Let's pray for the service today. Let's pray that God will be glorified in everything that we do. bow our heads and our hearts as we go to the Lord in prayer. Father, what a privilege it is to gather together in your house. Lord, we know that it's something that, Lord, we should never take for granted. But every time we gather together, Lord, we ought to look up and thank you. Lord, I'm reminded of those that don't have the same opportunities that we have. Some today around the world are meeting in secret and, uh, Lord, meeting in fear of, of being known, being uh, taken, Lord, as, as prisoners because of their faith in Christ. Lord, I pray today that we'll never take for granted the privilege that we have to gather together with your people. I pray today, Lord, that you'll meet our needs. You know all about us. Uh, Father, not only do you know what we've been through, but, Lord, you know what we're headed toward. And I pray, Father, that you'll just put a hedge of protection around your people. Bless those today, Lord, that are discouraged. Lord, I pray that they'll be reminded that uh, the God that we serve is the God that has all power. And he's the God that can meet any need. Lord, we pray this morning that you'll be with those that have lost loved ones. Pray for those that are sick today, Father, that you'll just uh, be the great physician in their life. Lord, bless the choir when they come to sing. And uh, Lord, I pray this morning that, uh, Father, that you'll just meet with us. And God, that you'll magnify yourself, manifest your glory in this place. Lord, we love you this morning. Thank you, Father, that we love you because you first loved us. Everything that we ask, Lord, we ask it in the name that is above every name. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. And amen.
been singing about blessed assurance, and, uh, and this song reminds me, uh, and today, this morning, I've uh, been reminded by hearing about Josiah's getting saved, and I, and I went back uh, to my childhood and remembered the time that the Lord saved me. I don't know why he saved me, but he must have seen something worth saving in me, and I'm so glad he did. I, I know a preacher uh, up at Binghamtown, uh, he's in heaven now, but he, uh, he had said, I heard his son say this, he had said that when, uh, when God changed uh, Abram's name to Abraham and Sarai to Sarah, um, that uh, he, he put the hump, he changed his name to Abraham. And I remember the hump he put in my heart that day, and I'll never get over it. I hope you remember when you got saved today. Something worth saving. Your work something. He saw it in you. I have wondered many times why the Lord saved me. Why he would grant me repentance and faith to believe. And I've wondered why he reached down so low for just one old sinner. Well, I suppose he must have seen something no one else could see. He must have seen something worth saving that day he reached out and forgave me he must have known how happy this wretched old sinner would be and though I feel I'll never be worthy my God is real and so is his mercy he must have seen something worth saving when he saved me. Not one single day goes by that I don't fail him. But I'm so glad that he's faithful and just to forgive. And there's no way that I can hope to ever repay him. So I'll just keep singing his praises as long as he lets me live. He must have seen something worth saving that day he reached down and forgave me. He must have known how happy this wretched old sinner would be. And though I feel I'd never be worthy, my God is real and so is his mercy. He must have seen something worth saving when he saved me.
Jesus saves. What a wonderful, wonderful thing that is today. To know that he is still seeking to save those that are lost. If you have your Bibles, we're looking in Psalm chapter 53. Psalm chapter 53. In fact, uh, when Reuben sung that song, he sung a little phrase in that song that is the title for my message today. I want to preach today on this thought, my God is real. My God is real. Psalm 53. Preacher was walking down the road one day and he came upon a, a bunch of little boys. They was playing with a puppy. And he was curious. He went over and asked them. He said, boys, what, what are you doing? And uh, one of them said, well, we found this little puppy and every one of us wants him. And so we decided that we was going to have a line contest. And the one that could tell the biggest whopper would get this puppy. And the preacher said, boys, don't you know that... Uh, God said that you ought not to lie. He said, well, when I was a little boy, I never told a lie. One of the little boys looked at the other and he said, uh, might as well go ahead and give the preacher the puppy. He said, there ain't no way we'll top that one. <laughs> I want to preach on something that's real today. Something that's real. Somebody that is real. Our Lord and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. My God is real. Psalm 53. Would you stand today? We're going to read one verse of Scripture. Verse 1, in fact, I'm going to read the entire verse, but I'm taking my thought just from that first sentence. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Corrupt are they and have done abominable iniquity. There is none that doeth good. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Father, I'm glad this morning that I know that you're real. You're not the figment of my imagination. Lord, you're not just something that folks have told me that I uh, grasp onto that would soothe my conscience and give me hope. But Lord, I know that you're real. I pray that every person in this building, that they've had that personal experience with you. And, and Lord, they're not taking uh, what others have said, but Lord, they know down deep in their hearts that you're real because you're real to them. Help me this morning to preach this message, Father. I'll be grateful for all the help that you give me, asking this in the name of your son, Jesus, I pray. You can be seated. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. A lot of the world's population says the same thing. They say that there is no God. I have a neighbor that says he's an atheist, and he says, there is no God. And yet the Bible says that it's the fool that has said that there is no God. But how can we know that God is real? On Wednesday nights we've been looking in apologetics through Brother Greg and uh, been trying to, uh, trying to articulate how that we can tell our lost friends and those that don't believe in God, how that we can show them that there is a God. Well, this morning we can know that there's a God, by, first of all, by what we've heard. And what we've seen and by what we have experienced. We first of all know that there's a God by, because we have an eternal witness. What we have heard. In other words, what does God say about himself? God speaks about his reality in three different ways. And first of all, he speaks through the inspired scripture. The Bible says in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. This morning God speaks through the inspired scriptures. All through this Bible. All 66 books in this Bible. From Genesis to Revelation. God is declaring his reality. Now what does the Bible say? First of all the Bible says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now there's many that attack the word of God and, and, and they say that it's not true. But can I tell you this morning, we don't have to defend the Bible. It'd be like a lion that was in a cage and uh, somebody poking a stick through the cage trying to hurt that lion. Somebody said, somebody ought to protect that lion. No, dear friend, just open the cage door. And that line will protect itself. The Word of God doesn't need my protection. The Word of God stands on its own. You might be interested to know that the Word God appears 4,200 times in the Word of God. Adrian Rogers said, if I had a knife in my hand and, and you said, I, I don't believe it will cut me. He said, there's two ways that I could prove that it would cut you. He said, first of all, I could give you a lecture on the properties of uh, surgical stainless steel. 
and the history of the knife. Or I could just cut you. And then you'd know that this knife can cut you. So this morning, I believe that we can open up the Word of God and the Bible defends itself. We know the Bible is real. We know that God is real through the inspired Scriptures. And then we know that God is real through the incarnate Son. The Bible says again, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Obviously, they've never read what Jesus taught and what Jesus preached and the things that our Lord did. Jesus himself spoke of the reality of God. He spoke of it during his temptation. Three times he was tempted, the Bible says, when the devil led him into the wilderness to be tempted. Luke chapter 4, Matthew chapter 4. And in each of those three temptations, Jesus speaks about the reality of God. First of all, Jesus said, Man shall not live by, by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of of God. Then he told the devil, when the devil said, if you'll just bow down and worship me, he said, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. And Jesus said to him, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then Jesus said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And so Jesus spoke of God during his temptation. Then Jesus spoke of God in the temple. The Bible says when he was 12 years old and uh, Mary and Joseph discovered that he was missing as they was on their way home from Jerusalem. They went back and they found Jesus astonishing the lawyers and those men that were so wise. And uh, whenever they said to him, said, why have you uh, troubled us and caused us this sorrow? Jesus made the statement, I must be about my father's business. Then later in the temple, Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Jesus spoke of God in his temptations. He spoke of God in the temple. And then Jesus spoke of God in his teaching. Uh, For example, Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 9 in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. We read in Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Matthew 6 and 33, Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things shall be added unto you. Matthew 15, Jesus spoke spoke of the commandments of God. And then in John 14 and verse number 2, he said, In my Father's house are many mansions. Over and over and over again, Jesus Christ spoke about the reality of God. We have the eternal witness that testifies of the reality of God through the inspired scriptures and through the incarnate Son and then thirdly through the indwelling Spirit. The Bible says in John 16 and 8, when the Spirit, he, when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. The Holy Ghost speaks of the reality of God. Jesus said in John 16 and verse 13, when the Spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. Romans 8, 16, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Will Rogers one time was trying to get a passport and they asked him, said, "Uh, do you have a birth certificate? And he said, well, why do you need to see my birth certificate? And they said, "Uh, we need proof of your birth. And he said, duh, I'm here. Proof enough. This morning God is here. God has manifested himself through the indwelling Spirit, we have that eternal witness that declares that there is a God. We have an eternal witness, and then we have an external witness. What we have seen, what you and I have seen through faith and through these eyes. When we look at creation, uh, the proof of God's existence is everywhere. I mean, all you have to do is look around. And the Bible says that the creation of God declares that there is a creator, that there is a God. The psalmist in Psalms chapter 8, verse 3 and 4, he said, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visited him? In, 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 in Psalms 33, uh, verse 6 through 9, the Bible says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made. And all the hosts of them by the breadth of his mouth. He gathereth the waters together as a heap. He layeth up the depths in storehouses. Let all the world stand in awe of him. Uh, Dear friend, because he spoke and it was done. Jeremiah himself says in Jeremiah 32 verse 17. Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heavens and the earth. And there's nothing impossible with you. 
can you, for the child of God, God's testimony about himself is seen clearly in his creation. We see that external witness. And then I want you to notice God in creation speaks to us, first of all, about the reality of creation. If you see a painting, you know that there had to be a painter. And whenever you see, uh, dear friend, a building, you know that there had to be a building. Whenever you look at your watch, uh, it automatically you know that there had to be a watchmaker. Whenever you see the creation, then you have to know that there is a creator. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's the reality of creation. Oh, dear friend, in Genesis 1, 31 verses, the name God is spoken of 32 different times. That famous verse in the beginning, God created. In that one verse, dear friend, God puts to rest all the false doctrines and the false religious systems and evolutionary thought. God puts all those things to bed when he declares that in the beginning, God created. It's God. That's the reality of God. In fact, in Romans chapter 1, uh, Paul speaks of those that have never heard the name uh, of Jesus. The Bible says that creation itself points to the fact that there is a creator behind the creation. All you have to do is look around and see what God has made, what God has created. That one verse in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. It destroys atheism because it speaks about the existence of God. It destroys polytheism, which says there's many gods because it doesn't say in the beginning God's created, but in the beginning God created. It, it, dest it destroys pantheism. Pantheism says that God is in everything. He's in this uh, wood pulpit. He's in those pews. He's uh, in this carpet. Uh, but dear friend, it destroys pantheism because in the beginning God created. God created everything. God is not in everything. God is over everything. He's the creator of everything that he is. It destroys evolution because God is the one that brought everything into being. God spoke and it was done. It destroys evolution. It destroys humanism. It says man is the peak. Man is the highest uh, being. But dear friend, the Bible teaches us that God is over everything. Destroys humanism. Henry Morris in his book, The Genesis Record, he said it's often been pointed out that if a person really believes in Genesis 1 and 1, he won't find it difficult to believe everything else in the Bible. That is, if God really created all things, then he created all things and he can do all things. Just believe Genesis 1 and 1 and every bit of the rest of the Bible, it just falls right into place. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created. Creation tells us that there is a God. Creation tells us that we're not him. And creation tells us, dear friend, that we're going to be accountable to the God of creation. That every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he is God to the glory of God the Father. Every knee will bow. The Bible says in Romans 1 and 20, Paul speaking, he said, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. One of the fundamental questions that everybody has to answer is this. Did God create us or did we create God? Now the evolutionists will tell us that we created God. In our imagination we created God. But that's not what this book says. This book says that God created us, took the dust of the earth. The Bible says formed it into a man, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and that created man became a living soul. God created man. There's, if there's no creation, there's no creator. If there's no creator, there's no Garden of Eden. If there's no Garden of Eden, there's no Adam. And if there's no Adam, there's no sin. And if there's no sin, there's no judgment. And if there's no judgment, then there's no rules. And, and every man, boy and girl, can do what he feels like doing, what's right in his own eyes, that it be every man for himself. But I want to declare this morning, there is a creation and therefore there had to be a creator. And because there was a creator, there was a Garden of Eden. There was an Adam. There was a man called Adam that sinned. 
And because of sin, we're all under the judgment of Almighty God. And every, everyone's going to confess one day that he is who he says he is. I've already done that, have you? Not only do you see the reality of creation. We see the enormity of creation. I'm telling you, even not only what we see with the naked eye, but what we can see with the telescope. Creation shouts, there is a God. The visible universe is, is 15 billion light years across. That's what you can see with your eyes or through a telescope. What scientists have been able to see, 15 billion light years across. You know what a light year is? The light year is where is how far light can travel in a year. Now, light travels 186,000 miles per second. Dear friend, you begin to multiply that by 60, and you have how far light travels in a minute. You begin to multiply it again by 60 again, and you have how far it travels in an hour. And then you multiply that in days and years, and then 15 billion, not just years, but light years. The distance that light can travel, uh, dear friend, in 15 billion light years, 15 billion times 186,000 miles per second. What I'm trying to tell you this morning, this creation is big because God is big. God spoke everything that he is into existence. Traveling at the speed of light, if it was possible to go in a circle, in one second, an object traveling at the speed of light would go around this globe seven times in one second. Dear friend, the visible universe that God has created, and that's just our universe. There's more out there that we cannot see. All I can say, preacher, explain it. I can't. It's just God. That's the reason this morning I know that God is real. Because all you've got to do is look at what the creator created and surely you'll come to the same conclusion. I know my God is real. Oh, we see the enormity, the reality of creation. We see the enormity of creation. I read this statistic. The water in the ocean would fill up about 1.4 billion cubic kilometers. That's not counting all the underground water and the water that's stored up in the icebergs and the polar caps. But what this uh, particular person that figured this out said, they said if you took an Olympic-sized swimming pool and made it into a scoop, and you begin to dip out the waters of the ocean, and you dipped every one second, it would take 17.5 million years to drain the oceans dry. And dear friend, when you think about that, all God had to say is let it be. And it became what it was and what it is, that's God. That is God. If you use the Grand Canyon as a scoop, 277 miles long, in some places as wide as 15 miles wide, in some places as deep as one mile deep. But if you took that scoop and if you made that into a scoop and you begin to uh, empty the ocean one scoop per hour, it would take, it would take, dear friends, 16 years to, divide, to drain the oceans. And yet in Psalms 95, verse 4 and 5, the Bible says, In his hands are the deep places of the earth. In the palm of his hand, God holds his creation. The psalmist said that God holds everything in his hand. Oh, dear friend, if you were to ask the scientists, if you were to ask them, uh, how, big, how much water is in the ocean? Uh, they would say 1.4 billion cubic kilometers. If you were to ask God, he'd say about that much. About that much. I'm telling you, that's the enormity of creation that declares there is a God. And then I want you to think about the complexity of creation. Imagine you're walking through the woods and you come up on uh, four sticks that have been put, put, been put together and they form the letter W. You go back the next day and you discover that they've taken some, something has taken sticks and it's made the letter E. You keep going back and keep going back until finally you read uh, the preamble of the Constitution that has been made out of sticks. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union. 
My dear friend, you would realize that that wasn't just some kid playing with sticks. This was somebody that has done something that they know about. I'm telling you, when you look at creation, this is not the work of evolution. It's not the work of the Big Bang. You know when you look at creation, somebody had to do this. And that somebody is God. Oh, our God is real this morning. Oh, I'm glad of that, aren't you? As far as we can look out with the telescope, you've got to understand something. It's not just that that's way out there that is the creation of God. If you took a bucket of dirt... If you could take a microscope then and begin to look down, you'd see the complexity of what God has created in those microisms, those little things that you have to look through a, a microscope to see. God created everything. Yes, he created the elephant, but he created the ant also. God created everything that he is. Think about the body, our bodies that God created. Listen to what David said when he looked at his body. He said, I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You know, that's one thing scientists cannot duplicate. They cannot recreate this body. I'm telling you, just a movement in my hand is a, a, a miracle. It's a marvel. It's God. God that has done this. They say there's 100 trillion cells in our body. Somebody said if you could unravel all those cells and all, the, all that DNA, if somehow you could just unravel it and stretch it out, just the DNA and the, the makeup of those cells, if it was stretched out, would go around planet Earth 47 times. Don't that make you think, buddy, I need to go on a diet. That's big, isn't it? To thank everything we see from the Father's red star to the smallest molecule that had happened but that because of the hand of a creator God. Somebody said, I don't believe in creation. Well, I tell you this morning, uh, what uh, if you thinking about creation, not believing in it, I, it would be like thinking about a tornado that would go uh, through a junkyard. I'm talking about those that say God didn't create everything, it just happened. The odds of that happening would be like a tornado going through a junkyard. And somehow the wind and the power of that tornado gathering all those pieces of junk, putting them together, and when it finishes passing through, you have a 747 jumbo jet sitting there. Well, that'd just be impossible. Oh, dear friend, you can't even compare that to the creation of God. Man says it's impossible, but the Bible says with God nothing is impossible. Oh, dear friend, our, our universe, somebody said we're evolving. No, we're devolving. We're getting worse and worse. Our, in fact, that's just, a, that's just one of the absolute uh, truths about uh, the nature. Wood left to itself, rocks, metal left to itself, it rusts. Our bodies left to itself, they'll decay one of these days. I'm telling you, as far as nature is concerned, we're not evolving, we're devolving. But spiritually, thank God, one of these days this mortal will put on immortality and it's all because of God. Oh, thank God. The complexity of creation. A little song that says, this is my father's world. The birds their carols raise. The morning light, the lily white declare their maker's praise. Not only do we have an eternal witness and an external witness, but we have an experiential witness, what we have experienced. I'm glad that I know that God is real by what I see, by what I've heard, but I'm thankful this morning that even above that, I'm glad that I know that God is real because of what I have experienced. I've experienced God's power. Psalms 34 and 8 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. I've tasted and I declare to you this morning, He is good. He is good. Let me be clear. We don't base our beliefs on experiences, but I'm thankful that a child of God does have experiences. I mean, we've been like Peter and John. We've been with the Lord if we're saved. We have that experience. I know God's real. He's real to me. The fool may say in his heart there is no God, but I've experienced, I've tasted and saw that there is a God. Let me just share with you three things that I've experienced that tells me that there is a God. First of all, I've experienced God in times of comfort. 
The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 1 and 3, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. I've experienced the comfort of God. I mean, when the world is pressing and crushing, and if God is not real, then tell me this morning, who was that that held us up when we was falling apart? I go down to the funeral home here at 2 o'clock, and I try to comfort that family. If all I've got is just words, if I didn't have God to speak of, the God of all comfort, then what I would say would be meaningless. But I'm telling you, we find comfort in God. If God's not real, who was that that whispered to my soul, it's going to be all right. I remember when God gave me peace when I battled cancer and I didn't think I was going to make it. God gave me peace. And I was reminded even then that even if I didn't make it, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Who was that? That wasn't my conscience. That was God. Reminded me that he's the God of all comfort. If that wasn't God speaking to me, then who was it that spoke to my soul when I was 17 years old? and let me know that I needed a Savior. There wasn't anybody else in that car with me the night that the Holy Spirit of God began to speak to me. God began to tell me that I needed to be saved. I had God there. I've experienced God in times of comfort. I'd like to be able to skip this next one, but I have to be honest with the Word of God. I've experienced God in times of conviction. In times of conviction. The very moment you get saved, you become a recipient of the Holy Ghost. He moves in on the inside of you. And the Bible says he is sent to reprove the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. If you're saved, you know what I'm talking about. You know when I speak about conviction, you know exactly what I'm saying. He is the God that we've experienced in times of conviction. Oh, there's been times that I felt so good that I felt like spiritually I could soar with the eagles. And then there's been times when I sensed the presence of God and I didn't feel so good about feeling his presence because what he was saying to me is, you're wrong. You've got a bad attitude. You need to apologize for what you've said. Has that ever happened to you? Dear friend, that's just another way of knowing that God is real because we have experienced the conviction of Almighty God. He doesn't just come alongside of us and tell us how good things are and encourage us, but whenever we sin and come short of his glory, the Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of us lets us know. Who is that? That's God. That's God speaking. I've experienced him at times of conviction. If if God's not real, then who was that that told me that I need to reconcile with my brother? Who is that told me that, that I'm not honoring God? By the way, I'm living. Who is that that told me uh, whenever I convicted me when I sinned to come short of his glory? I tell you who it is. It's the very one that sits on the throne. He is God. He tells me whenever I sin and I do wrong. Does he do that for you? If he doesn't, dear friend, what it says to me this morning, it ought to say to you, you need to have an experience with him. I've experienced time, God, in times of conversion. Not only my life, but I've seen the lives of others. If God's not real, who is it that took away the desire from, for, alcohol, from, for alcohol from that drunk and, and saved him and put him on a seat in a Baptist church or at some other church? Who is that? If God's not real, then dear friend, who is it that turned that promiscuous young lady into a godly wife and a godly mother? If God's not real, who changed her? If God's not real. Then who turned the crook into an honest person? Peg made mention this morning about God changing names. He also changed the name of Jacob, the trickster, the supplanter, the schemer, and changed his name to Israel, a prince, the prince of God. Who was that? That's God. He didn't do that by himself. If God's not real, who is that that speaks to me in a small, still voice? If God's not real this morning, Who was that that passed by uh, Wednesday night and and began to deal with little Josiah's heart and let him know that he needed to be saved? If God's not real, who did that? Oh, dear friend, if God's not real, oh, yes, God is real. He's very real in my soul. 
Oh, dear friend, I know God is real for he's washed me and made me whole. His love for me is like pure gold. My God is real, for I can feel him down deep in my soul. Thank God he's real. He is real. When somebody asks you, how do you know God is real? Tell them what you've heard. Have you opened up this Bible, this book, this book that God wrote, and God began to speak to you? Tell them, dear friend, what you've seen. I mean, you've seen the creation of God and, and let them know that when you saw the creation, you knew that behind that creation, there was a creator. And then let them know what you've experienced. Folks will tell me every now and then, I don't know how to witness. I don't, how, I don't know how to tell anybody about Jesus. I don't know how to lead them to the Lord. You know the best way that you witness to somebody? Tell them what God's done for you. Just tell him what he's done for you. I mean, the Bible says in Revelation 12 and 12 that we overcome the devil by the word of our testimony. Just tell him what's happened to you. Did something happen to you this morning? Can you go back in your mind's eye and see that day when God became real to you? I grew up in a preacher's home, and, and all my life I, I've heard preaching that God is real and testimonies and songs and all those things that told me that God is real. But, dear friend, there was a night in 1973 that God became real to me. I knew then it's more than just a testimony of somebody else. I know God is real because he lives down deep in my soul. 